Our speaker for today's meeting is nationally renowned Dr. Georgios Pappas. Dr. Pappas is a physician from Greece, specializing in zoonotic infections and epidemic preparedness. He is known for his detailed report on the largest laboratory accident in Southeast Asia, which released Brucella and recently published in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, a warning regarding animal hosts with COVID-19. He will present on the unbearable mitigation of SARS-CoV-2 endemicity. Dr. Pappas, the floor is yours. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. It's an honor for the invitation and for all of you that are here. I have been changing the title a lot and many times, started differently, and now I ended up with this. The main question and my main focus today will be how unbearable the burden of the viral mitigation is and how unbearable the burden of SARS-2 endemicity is. Many people consider that endemicity is a joyride, is something that signifies the end of a pandemic and the end of a special condition. But that's not the true and there are many fallacies about it. I counted 14 fallacies and I will focus on these. Let me briefly introduce myself. I like zoonosis. I love zoonosis. I have written a lot about brucellosis. I met Dr. Dixon back more than 15 years ago in Greece in a consensus meeting we did about the treatment of brucellosis. It remains a good set of recommendations and it's been used worldwide. I also like the epidemiology of various infectious diseases and the history of infectious diseases. Sometimes outbreaks that didn't happen, or for example, the plug outbreak that was averted in Soviet Union 60 years ago. My st second interest is epidemic preparedness, and I have written about it. I specialized in attack scenarios. Attack scenarios are different from modeling. Modeling is more scientific. Attack scenarios are more uh, social, are the worst case scenarios, are the uh, scenarios where you think what is the worst that could happen in the society, not only in health related terms, if an epidemic or an outbreak sometimes a biological weapon, a bioterrorist attack would happen. So I have studied all this and the socioecology of genetic infections. Thus, the pandemic, the current pandemic, was uh, something that unfortunately was not surprising to me. And I also studied how the society, how the public views infectious diseases, outbreaks, and how these outbreaks affect their uh, psychological situation. Down on the left, the article, The Psychosocial Consequences of Infectious Diseases, it was an article we wrote in 2011. It was barely cited it, that uh, it had gotten about 10 citations. And then suddenly during the pandemic, it erupted. It became a very popular article. It keeps getting cited from hundreds of researchers years later. Now, another brief introduction before going to the 14 fallacies. I'm from Greece, and I will be using Greece sometimes as an example for the pandemic and for the current situation of the pandemic. How do we compare Greece with the United States? In terms of cases, we are roughly the same, apart from the first wave where Greece excelled, and then everything was rather similar to the United States, both in terms of cases, also in terms of deaths. These two people were the crucial people, the crucial persons in the beginning of the pandemic in Greece, in the first phase. The left one is Professor Chodras, a specialist in infectious diseases. And the second one was a minister of the then and current government. Both came uh, into national television and informed about the current pandemic situation. And they were widely accepted. Everybody obeyed to them. It was a ritual to listen to them and to practice whatever they said. It was a clever choice. It was a clever duo because the left one was not only a scientist with a huge AIDS index and perhaps the leading infectious disease specialist of Greece and one of the leading specialists in Europe, but also he was a religious man. And in Greece, religion is important. So he was widely accepted in religious circles and he was widely accepted from religious people, from the religious public. The second one, on the other uh, hand, was not a man of God, but a man of the people. He was easily, you could see him easily and uh, very naturally to give orders in uh, whole army brigades, but also uh, and then go to a uh, Iggy Pop show and go backstage and smile and socialize with Iggy Pop. A man who could be very practical 
and very hands-on in every situation. So this worked until May 28, 2020. Then the information, the daily information, the weekly information, any information from official channels stopped. We didn't have any coronavirus in the first wave. We were close to zero. But then the information didn't begin again or didn't begin adequately. So what happened? From success, we went to U.S. because everything after a period, and nowadays, our average deaths per million people exceed that of the U.S. It's not a very successful story. And it, it doesn't have to do anything with the vaccination because vaccination rates are roughly the same or slightly better than the ones of the United States. It's a very geographical issue, endemicity of SARS-2 in Greece, and its mortality is located in northern Greece in the red and deep red and uh, pink uh, perfections that you see in the map in the northern Greece. There's a very steep gradient from north to south and doesn't have to do with rich or poor. It has to do with all these things outlined on the right. The first and most important is the church. The church in Greece is a very significant organization. Perhaps it's more powerful than any government or any political party. And for historical reasons, for uh, reasons of belief or for religious reasons, for reasons of faith, it doesn't matter, but the church has power. Early on in the pandemic, there was a very strong debate about whether there was a risk from the Holy Communion. The Holy Communion in the Greek Orthodox Church is performed with a common spoon. You drink bread and wine from the same spoon that the one before you and the one after you drinks. So there was a lot of talk about it and some senior scientists preferred to put their religious belief up front and say that it's okay, you can do this. There's no reason to worry about uh, viral transmission. It was a, a rather uh, bizarre situation. And then we had uh, the protests and that some uh, people from uh, monasteries and from uh, peripheral religious organizations were uh, up front. There were some uh, people from the church who were advocating against vaccination, against the pandemic mitigation, against anything. There still are some of these people and they still play a significant role. And it's obvious in the recent election results. The other important thing about Greece is that the Greek economy is largely based on tourism. So in the summer of 2020, we started pretending that we had no coronavirus. We started pretending that we were COVID-free. Every island said that it was COVID-free. My town said that it was COVID-free, although we had cases. And then the officials said, no, it's not our cases. They just were students here and now they don't live here and so on. We kept denying the presence of the virus. And the other important thing is that there were some scientists that had a lot of influence. On the left, you know John Ioannidis. John Ioannidis is a Greek scientist. In fact, he was in Iran in Greece until he was professor of epidemiology in my hometown, in the University of my hometown, and before going to Stanford. Now, John is one of the famous dissidents during the pandemic. I can say that we were sort of friends in the past, but we haven't talked again after April 2020. There was a huge gap brought between us due to the pandemic and the different views we had. Now, but uh, John is the most cited Greek scientist. He's a famous scientist in Greece, and he was all over the mass media in uh, major TV channels and major newspapers, but also in uh, right-wing newspapers of peripheral and doubtful accreditation. So, his views against the necessity of vaccination or pandemic mitigation were widely shared and keep being widely shared in Greece. And sometimes they have created a rather uneasy situation in Greece. But sometimes some uh, systemic scientists also tried to keep up with the government and say certain things that were not scientific. This thing with the dots here is from a presentation from the scientific committee about the pandemic, the officials on the pandemic. And it's supposedly this thing, this drawing says that if you have a school class with 25 students, there will be less transmission than if you have a class with 15 students. Uh, this was an official discussion sometime when we started, the pandemic started getting deranged in Greece. The final and most important thing that we have to know about Greece is the, the Russian factor. Greece, for some strange reason, loves Russia 
and for some strange reason, again, doesn't love the U.S. much. This is a study that the uh, Eurobarometer, that's Greece is on the far right. The majority of the Greeks believe that Russia is not responsible for the current situation in Ukraine, for the Ukrainian invasion. Now, you understand that these people are influenced by certain beliefs. And these certain beliefs, we do know that Dr. Kavanagh has written about it, how the Russian bots have affected and spread this information and affected the people's beliefs during the pandemic and before the pandemic, how they augmented in the growing anti-vaccine movement. So, is it over? Is it really over? Has the pandemic ended? Because uh, Tedros Ghebreyesus said so. Because Dr. Tedros said so. Was May 5 a day to celebrate similar to the day when World War II ended? But that's not true because you need to have a magician like Hanusen, who was a magician performing in Nazi Germany in the 30s, to make the pandemic disappear. The pandemic doesn't disappear because we want it to disappear. The pandemic doesn't disappear because we say so. The pandemic doesn't end because it stops being something exceptional. It stops being exceptional because it is our every day. And there was a lot of expectation to reach pandemic end. From early on, in the autumn of 2020, you see talking about the pandemic fatigue. But uh, the pandemic fatigue is something that refers to people and not to the virus. The virus was um, anything but tired and didn't exhibit any fatigue in the autumn of 2020. Even uh, reliable journalists, for example, Karen Braswell, whose uh, reporting was and uh, writing was uh, awarded during the pandemic, considered Omicron the break. She, she said that Omicron might be the break that we just may mean that might be the end of the pandemic. Obviously, it wasn't, and we will see why immediately after. And of course, there was a lot of talk, and there is a lot of revisionism going on and talking about how lockdown killed people. And uh, there's a lot of this discussion based on the so called Swedish example or the UK example. These are not examples, these are distortions of the truth, and this has been proven a lot, but nobody is talking about it when some people try to revise the actual history. So, the first fallacy, the virus is gone, the virus is not gone. This chart is the chart of, of the Greek uh, hospitalizations, of hospital admissions due to, to SARS-2 in Greece. You see that uh, there were huge waves in the second half of 2021, and there was a huge wave in the late summer of 2022. But the things keeps going on. The, the virus is not disappearing. Hundreds of weekly hospitalizations due to SARS-2 in Greece. And I'm using Greece as an example because we have, still have a weekly report. The second fallacy. Many people kept talking about it since the beginning of the pandemic, that don't worry, this is another influenza. But this is not seasonal. As an excellent during natural abuse microbiology discusses, this is not a seasonal virus at the moment. And it will be not a seasonal virus for the time being. You can expect to have a new way due to a new immune escape variant every three or four months. So you can't expect to have a seasonal influenza period. And even then, even if it was a seasonal influenza, an influenza-like virus, the burden will be bigger. Why? Because the virus is more morbid. The virus causes significantly more morbidity than influenza. And it's a virus that causes this morbidity at the moment, even at the Omicron period. This is a study published in JAMA a few weeks ago and it compares mortality from COVID-19 and from influenza. And the mortality, the difference is huge for the unvaccinated for SARS-2. But even for boosted people, the mortality from COVID-19 is bigger, way bigger than the mortality of influenza. So this is not an influenza. Another study from Switzerland that showed the same, that the mortality of hospitalized patients with SARS-2 was significantly larger than the mortality of people hospitalized with influenza. And there's also the Greek experience. The worst influenza day in Greek, in Greek modern Greek history, in terms of ICU occupancy, was in 2011, and uh, when we have 185 beds occupied. 
the world sales to day was way worse. It was more than 850 beds occupied. The total influenza ICU this season was 68 beds. On average, every day we have these 60 or 70 beds occupied in Greece. The total influenza death during this 2022-2023 period was 26. The weekly SARS-2 deaths in Greece at the moment remain around 50. The weekly deaths are not the total deaths. So the third fallacy is that uh, endemic is something minor. Aristotelakis wrote about it, how endemic doesn't mean powerless. In the beginning of 2022 in uh, Nature, a very instructive and uh, article that remains up to date and remains very instructive even today. And we have to remember that endemicity is not something that we have to cherish. Because down on the left is a map from a CDC photo showing the smallpox endemicity in 1945. Smallpox was endemic. Nobody celebrated the endemicity of smallpox. Smallpox killed. And uh, up, uh, up on the left, we have a, a snippet from a fact sheet about dengue from the World Health Organization explaining how the disease is endemic in more than 100 countries. Dengue is not something to cherish about, and it's endemicity is not something to cherish about. And even worse, this is malaria endemicity from the CDC Yellow Book for 2024, current Yellow Book from CDC. And you see that the, the, almost the whole South Hemisphere is endemic for malaria. And this is not, again, something to celebrate or something to applaud or something to feel relieved about. But some people say, SARS, the virus needs to adapt. So don't worry, the virus will adapt and become milder when it becomes endemic. Why? Because we presume that the other coronaviruses, the common cold coronaviruses, adapted. They, we presume that they started like this. They started producing an epidemic some say that the Russian flu from 1889 was essentially the introduction of the common cold coronavirus on C43. It's an interesting and well-written article, but it's full of theories and anything cannot be proved. Nobody can presume that the virus will adapt. And the history says that when viruses adapt, perhaps something different happens. Humans adapt to the virus. And humans adapting to the virus is a process that may last decades or centuries, and sometimes this process will be accompanied by hundreds of thousands of deaths. And one forgets that the virus doesn't need to adapt. Some people say the virus will adapt, so the virus will not kill its host. So it will have hosts to keep going on, to keep multiplying and keep surviving if the virus is considered to be something that survives. Now, one forgets that the virus, the large part of the viral transmission from an infected host happens in the early presymptomatic and the early symptomatic phase. The transmission cycle is essentially over when severe and critical illness and eventually death evolves. So the virus doesn't care if it eventually kills its host. It has already used its host for, trans for effective transmission. So there's no pathophysiologic theory in this fallacy that the virus has become milder. But some people say Omicron is milder. Yes, okay, Omicron per se is milder. But we have to remember that case fatality rate is one thing and infectivity is another. If you infect 100 people with a virus causing with a 1% case fatality rate, you have one death. If you infect 1,000 people with a more infective variant like Omicron, which has a case fatality rate of 0.1%, then you have the same result. You have, again, one death. So infectivity, in the case of uh, Omicron, the infectivity is the major issue, the one that keeps the pandemic going on and keeps piling up cases and deaths and ICU admissions. The main issue is the infectivity, and this is why we keep having deaths despite considering that the pandemic over. And just see the numbers. From January 1st, 2023 until the end of May, you had more than 38,000 deaths only for 2023. In Greece, we had more than 1,600 deaths. We are outpacing you on terms of deaths per million. We are going even worse, but perhaps we are just counting more. Another fallacy is that we can predict the viral move. The notion that we know 
how the virus is evolving, how the virus is performing. And now, remember when Delta happened? I remember because I was in vacation, and then Dr. John Pavlakis, who is NIH in the HIV department, sent me a message in the morning and uh, look what happened in Massachusetts. The vaccinated are the vaccinated are infected. We were happy that the vaccination showed a way out, but suddenly vaccination showed survival benefit, but not a way out of the pandemic because Delta happened and Delta meant reinfection and infections and breakthrough infections. And then Omicron happened. When we managed to understand how Delta works and we had the vaccines and then we had the treatments and we had the, the, the first treatments and we had the monoclonal antibodies and we were happy that we knew how to deal with this virus. Then Omicron happened. We are not sure how Omicron happened, how Omicron evolved, probably from an immunocompromised person, but perhaps from mice or perhaps from running and detected somewhere in Africa, somewhere in a dark place where no sequencing goes on. But it doesn't matter. What matters is that once more, the virus caught us by surprise. And the virus keeps going on this from uh, Daniele Focosi. And this is how the XBB variant evolves. Now we are deep in the evolutionary progress of the virus and we have gone to the XBB which is a recombinant of Omicron 2 and Omicron 2 fifth generation specimens. And this every day evolves. And we can't know and we can't predict how this evolves because we are not sequencing. This is from Cornelius Remer who went on to see who samples, who sends gen, uh, sequencing data in May 2023. What countries? The United States does a good job and Canada does a good job and China and Australia. But Europe is lagging and you won't find Greece here. We are not doing such things. We are doing a bit of work on this. We should be somewhere around 40 or 50 or 41st place. We are not sequencing. We don't know exactly what kind of virus circulating around us. And then the other main problem is that we keep believing, we keep considering that the virus is something that we didn't expect. When we like it, we say that it was a, that it was a black clan, something unexpected. But then we have to understand that the viral evolution and the appearance of a novel variant with major consequences is a great one, something that we should expect and do something about. Another thing that we don't know was the thing I wrote about in the bulletin of atomic science last week is that the virus doesn't need the humans to survive and go on and evolve. It has the animal kingdom. Now, armadillos and arrhythmia receptors found extinct species, extinct variants of concern in armadillos months or more than a year after their extinction, their last isolation from humans. And we do know that in North America, this happens also with deer, with white-tailed deer. But white-tailed deer are sampled for another reason, and this we are lucky to find the vast expansion of the virus. 30% of white-tailed deer in the United States have been infected, have been in contact with the virus, according to a recent study. And of course, we should remember the story with the mink, the variants that evolved in Denmark in the early in the pandemic, and the fact that the virus has an increased evolutionary rate when it enters a mink population. And recently in Poland, which is the second country in terms of worldwide, in terms of mink industry after China, in Poland they found in mink some extinct variants uh, that circulated in humans more than a year ago. And the census presumed that some other animal in the white line was infected and then it infected mink. So the virus, even the variants of concern, even Delta that we've forgotten about, or Gamma or Beta, they keep circulating in some unknown wildlife animal species. And we will be surprised and we will be shocked if they come back. Let's hope that we are lucky enough for them to not come back, but it will be luck, not our surveillance. Some say that's another simple issue here, that uh, don't worry, we will eventually achieve herd immunity. People forget that herd immunity is something that has two prerequisites. The first is that you have a stable virus, and you don't have a stable virus, you have an evolving virus. And the second is we need to have induced vaccine or natural or disease-induced protection that 
is long term. We don't have long term protection, at least on infection, we don't have any waning. Another fallacy, though we shouldn't worry, we have drugs, we have medications, we can treat. Yes, we do have Paxlovid, Mirmatlovid, Ritonavir. It's an excellent drug. It's, there are still no issues of resistance. But, but a major problem is how much we are using it. In the morning, I had a patient who, a 70 year old patient who was infected last Friday. And she called me today. Wednesday, more than six days ago, uh, later, to tell me that uh, I was infected and I'm not feeling very well. I have a low oxygen saturation and uh, I can't breathe very well. And uh, I told her, why didn't you call so we can arrange for you to have Paxlovid? And she said, I don't didn't know about it. Nobody told me about it. So there is an issue with the utility and adequate. We should use it as long as we have it because... We don't have monoclonals and we won't have monoclonals. I think that uh, we have given up the idea about using monoclonal antibodies. Nobody uh, in their right mind will develop a monoclonal antibody because the virus will soon overcome. A major fallacy is that the pandemic is a matter that should worry only the immune compromised. But we have to remember that for the people who are immune compromised to this new normal, is not something that is acceptable. For example, we do know that on average, people with solid cancers have a six-week delay in their treatments due to the effects of the pandemic, due to potential infections of themselves or of their surroundings or their relatives or even their healthcare personnel dealing with them. And of course, these people cannot easily socialize, they cannot easily circulate, go to the meeting, go to the market to buy something because the transmission chains, as long as the virus circulates, there are transmission chains and uh, multiple transmission chains like something suffocating them. And of course, the main problem remains that there is there are no mitigation measures. I think that neither in Greece nor in most of the countries around the world. And we have forgotten that masks Wearing masks is not something just a practical thing, not something that protects me and protects the others from me, but it's a marker of social responsibility. It's a marker of belief to science. But masks have been presented last months of the pandemic as a burden that we have to get rid of. No, it's not a burden. It's a, a marker of social responsibility and trust in science. And of course, I think that in the U.S. you are in a better situation regarding indoor air quality. The CDC acknowledged the, the need for a better indoor air quality. The ASRI has developed new regulations. There are uh, funds for anyone willing to upgrade indoor air quality. In Greece, we don't talk about it. It's, it's shocking how much we choose to not talk about it. And it's shocking because this could be as significant as the sanitation of water, that's the act of John Snow hundreds of years ago. The absence of mitigation includes testing. This is a very recent article from JAMA Internal Medicine, and it shows that there has been an increase of hospital infections and hospital-acquired SARS-2 because there is no testing, universal admission testing. And you have to do universal admission testing in certain situations. You can't afford to have SARS-2 as a nosocomial infection. Some people say there was a recent uh, study that said, okay, it was only 5%, mortality was only 5%. But let's get serious. You go to a hospital to get better. You don't go to a hospital to get infected by SARS-2 and in the hospital and then have a chance one in 20 to die. This is not the way hospital should work. This is not the way healthcare should work. But we have to remember that Although we consider that the future is here, as William Gibson said, who has written High Rise and Neuromancer, this future seems that it's not very evenly distributed, not only in terms of social and differences and minorities and economic differences and even country differences, but also in terms of health differences. We have to understand that there are certain people that need for us to build around them a protective environment. We have to act against the normalization of illness. And this is another fallacy that, okay, the immunocompromise should be careful, but we are young and healthy, so there's no problem for us. 
The real endemic though will be long COVID and we do know it. Another recent article that just published, uh, I think in the end day, from Sweden shows that for a percentage of people, there is severe health impairment even two years after the initial infection. Two years later, let's say 2%, according to this graph here. I, I'm not saying 2%, I'm saying 0.2%. Imagine you have uh, 10 million people infected annually in the US. 0.2% means that the significant tens of thousands of people will be severely disabled in the long term and will have serious health issues in the long term. And we don't know what to do with these people yet. We don't know how to treat the long COVID. We, are, we have been extremely late in developing adequate studies for long COVID, for understanding long COVID. And of course, it's not only long COVID, but there are the other long-term consequences. Ziad Alali has written and his team have done excellent studies of this. The long-term cardiovascular outcomes. We keep hearing about people, young people dying from cardiovascular disease and they had one or two or three infections. And nobody talks about this. It's an elephant in the room. And essentially, we have to understand that in the future, how many times the number of infections from SARS-2 will be included in the new risk score along diabetes and hypertension and personal history and cholesterol levels, etc., and smoking. This is the effect of the virus, and we keep not discussing it. Not only cardiovascular, it's long-term neurological outcomes, and of course, diabetes. There are more than 10 studies that show an increased risk of diabetes post-COVID. And imagine how much this costs. Now, diabetes is an expensive illness. And imagine how much this costs if you have an increase of, let's say, 2% in the prevalence of diabetes. The other thing that we don't discuss about in the long-term consequences is the immunity effect. People are talking about the immunity debt, but I don't see how the immunity debt would cause an increase in the pediatric and contracranial infections in 2023 in the US. This was published last week in MMWR. And it's a shocking increase, you see here on the right, that could not be explained pathophysiologically in terms of immunity death. And it has been proven, for example, that for respiratory syncytial virus, the previous infection by SARS-2 was a predisposing factor. There was more than double of the people who got RSV infection, either less than five years old or less than one year old, were infected compared to people who did not get an RSV infection. So SARS-2 infection may work as a predisposing factor for other infections. And Sweden is a typical example because there was no immunity depth there because there were no mitigation and no, no mitigation measures. But they had this huge the red peak, this huge RSV season last winter. And the only plausible explanation would be that previous SARS-2 virus infection was the one that predisposed to an increased possibility of other viral infections, including RSV. Another fallacy we have to do with the deal with the economy. This has been solved from the beginning. This was an article in the summer of 2021 comparing the rich countries that attempted mitigation with the rich countries attempting elimination. And the countries for attempting elimination were the red lines. They had in the first, uh, on the left, you see that they didn't have many deaths. They were the ones that bounced back better in terms of gross domestic product. They achieved a, a positive gross domestic product increase and increase in gross domestic product from early 2021 compared to mitigation. Another idea is that perhaps healthcare can, can deal with it, don't worry. But we keep forget that there is a significant increase in burnout and satisfaction with work in physicians during the pandemic. There is a significant increase in depersonalization and exhaustion. There is a significant need for keeping up to date with a lot of new studies and dealing with losses. Sometimes there are people who have to deal with losses of their own ones who got infected by them who were infected in the hospital and so on. This whole thing cannot be sustained and cannot be continued 
And unfortunately, it keeps continuing and it keeps continuing in an already overburdened healthcare system, a healthcare system that can't go on like this. Some people think that we shouldn't worry because the truth will automatically prevail. Now, Dr. Ehrlich, Dr. Paul Ehrlich, said that there will always be epidemics of ignorance. It was in the early 20th century, and this here is Edward Robinson playing uh, Dr. Ehrlich as a hero in the 1940 film. And the thing is that we always should continue to fight for the truth and fight against this information. But some people say, okay, it's not our job. It's not the physicians or the healthcare personnel on their ones dealing with public health job. It's someone else's job. I don't know who it's the social media platforms or the government or the public organizations or whoever. No, it's our job to deal with misinformation. In The Unbearable Lightness of Being, this is a film based on the Milan Kundera book. Back in 1988, Daniel Day-Lewis was the carefree doctor. He was very young. We were all very young and we were very impressed back then. Many of us were impressed by this carefree doctor. We were young. Who cares about nothing? But then the situation around him makes him to take a stand. We are political and social entities apart from scientists. And sometimes we do have to take a stance, a stance for protecting people around us, for, for protecting the healthcare system, for fighting disinformation. Finally, we have to understand that this new normal is not normal. We didn't win. We have an uneasy draw with the virus. We have a very fragile endemicity at the moment. But this normal seems extremely unnormal for some of the people around us, and we do have to do something about it. The first thing being recognizing all these fallacies and trying to fight against them and trying to make more people understand that these fallacies are of crucial importance for the health of some of us, some of people around us, perhaps for some of us too. Well, that's all.